Science and thousands of years of human history have shown us that there are a number of things that can make a big impact on our lives. If you can choose to focus on any number of them with some consistency, you can reduce your stress, you can feel more personal control, and um, you can uncover deep reservoirs of well-being. You can even train your brain to focus on what matters more so you can enjoy life more. So here are seven things seven seven things that you can control that make a, can make a big impact on your life all you have to do is decide to engage them again with some consistency and the fruit will unfold not only for you but for the people that you love if you're new here then my name is dr elisha goldstein i'm a psychologist i'm the founder of the mindful living collective and i help people go from feeling stuck and overwhelmed to feeling a greater sense of personal control so they can focus more on what matters and enjoy life more And I do this through my online programs and my personal consultations. And if you'd like to join a personal coaching program with me, then go ahead and follow the link below to the Uncover the Power Within program. Okay, here are seven things that you can do to sprinkle into your daily life. And all you have to do is do it with some level of consistency. And if you do, it can make a big impact on your life. So I'm going to go over, just name all the seven of them, and then we're going to go over each one one by one. Okay, the first one is we just want to remind ourselves to be curious in daily life. Approach everyday things with curiosity and learn how to savor those things. The second thing is we need to learn how to forgive mistakes, the big ones and the small ones from ourselves and for others. The third one is show gratitude for the good moments. Actually be aware of them and show gratitude for them and and learn how to be more graceful during the more challenging moments. The fourth one, practice compassion and nurture connections. The fifth one, make peace with imperfection inside and out. The sixth one, embrace vulnerability by trusting others and themselves. And the seventh one, accept and appreciate that all things really come and go. Okay, so let's talk about number one, practice being curious. One of the beautiful things about being human is we have this part of our brain that's called procedural memory. And what that means is our brain can do something or engage something or relate to something once, twice, three times, and it just memorizes that procedure so we can like handle more difficult things. And um, there's a beauty to that. So life can become easier and more flowing. I don't have to think about how to walk or drive a car or eat my breakfast or talk to certain people. And there's a hindrance to that because it falls into certain unhealthy patterns that just become automatic. We fall into an autopilot with it. And so our bad habits also become more automatic. Or as Abraham Joshua Heschel said, who was a, a rabbi and a peace activist, and, um, and he marched with Martin Luther King, and he said, uh, life is routine, and routine is resistance to wonder. So we lose out on the wonder of everyday life. So how do we recapture that? Um, that can make a big impact in our life, can turn a, a difficult day into a wonderful day. Little micro moments of positive emotions have been shown to give us a real boost. And whatever we focus on makes a big impact in how we feel. So we want to be able to shift things. So we bring a beginner's mind to something. So this is engaging thing, things as if for the very first time. So we can do this while getting into the shower for a moment and just bringing our senses to the shower, smelling the soap that's there, um, feeling the temperature and the feeling of the shower. Try it. It can, it can turn what's a routine activity into a spa. We can take a moment before we're eating and just attend to what we're eating <laughs> just to begin with and bring curiosity to what it is and where it came from and who was involved in getting it to us. And... Um, and then begin to taste it as if it was something that we tasted for the very first time. We can uh, engage our children, the people we love, or our coworkers, you know, as people just like me, uh, who want to feel cared about and understood, and see if we can step out of the patterning and 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 just l- deeply listen to those people. So we can do all these things with a beginner's mind, and as we do this, we open up to a sense of appreciation and gratitude that's there because we're focusing in this way. Uh, and we open up to the wonder that's there, all the possibilities of life. Okay, number two, life comes with its obstacles. We all have intentions, habits we want to make. We want to exercise. We want to meditate. We want to play guitar. We want to we do things that are good for us and for other people. 
and we have all these great intentions. But what we find is that throughout the process, we get busy or we get tired or we find ourselves doubting ourselves. We get caught in a process of avoiding what's uncomfortable or just feeling too restless to actually engage in the habits of life that we want to do. So what naturally happens next is we start to criticize ourselves and tell us tell our reason, all the reasons we can't do it or, um, or just berate ourselves for that. But what we find is that something that can make a big impact on our life is learning the process of forgiving ourselves and even investigating what took us off track and invite ourselves to begin again. We have to understand that life is a change journey. And even if we have intentions, we can get really, we can be really sticking with them really well at first, but then we're inevitably going to fall. That's just part of being human. And so we practice this. We learn to forgive ourselves to get back on track. So what do we find? We find that when we're off track, that's not a sign of failure. It's an opportunity. That's the difference in the mindset here. Being straying from our intentions is not a failure. It's an opportunity to learn and come back even stronger. So we have this phrase called forgive, investigate, and invite. So every time we have an intention, whether it's exercise or being a a better partner to the people that we love or a friend or um, eating better or whatever it might be, right? And we expect at some point to fall off. We forgive ourselves for the time gone by. That's the past. Lily Tomlin once had a saying, forgiveness means giving up hope for a better past. And so, uh, and so we forgive ourselves, but we don't let ourselves off the hook. We in- investigate what took us off track. Hey, I had this intention to eat better. What happened? Um, maybe I got tired or maybe it was too hard or maybe it just wasn't the right fit for me. Or maybe um, I, had an, I had an opportunity to investigate, but mm, I was on a few days and it didn't really work out for me. What's something else I can do to support myself? Maybe I need to get a couple friends to join me or maybe I need to put my shoes next to my bed in the morning so my brain sees it. Lots of different things that we can begin to adapt and experiment with. We can use the previous one of being curious, staying curious. So um, so we can do this. We forgive, investigate, and invite. And we can do this over and over again, turning obstacles into opportunities. And uh, therefore, we just learn to get better and better and stronger and stronger at making the changes and the habits that we want to make in our lives. Number three, hold emotions lightly. People who are successful in life and what i mean by that feel a deep sense of purpose and meaning and are living in line with their values uh, hold emotions lightly and so what does this mean this means that when you start paying attention to emotions you start learning that they are energy in motion emotion and and so and they have this nature of just coming and going all the time whether it's something that's comfortable or uncomfortable or neutral And so um, what we want to learn how to do is be able to hold them with this understanding that they have this nature of coming and going. And what we do is we, this enables us not to get so wrapped up in the difficult feelings, but instead hold them with a gentleness and tenderness. Maybe even learning from them and getting better and better at understanding what we're needing in a particular moment. When the comfortable emotions come, we can learn to hold them also lightly because we know they're also not permanent, but we can learn to be grateful for the good moments. Like, hey, this is a really good moment. And in life, there's really good moments. Let me allow myself to really savor this experience. It's a three-step process that I love doing in my life. Just being on the lookout for good moments and saying that, hey, this is a good moment. In life, there's good moments. Can I just allow myself to savor this for a few moments? Get those neurons firing together and wiring together around that type of direction. And so as we do this with this experience, we can learn to be more grateful for what's good and more graceful during the inevitable difficult times, finding ourselves in a much deeper sense of balance with life. Okay, now take a moment to reflect on or think about any of the last few things that I mentioned. If you turn the dial by, let's say, 10% on any number of them, what would change for you in the days, weeks, and months ahead? Go ahead and think about that. Reflect on which one you'd want to turn the dial on by 10% and comment on it below. And then see what other people have wrote and and comment on theirs or like theirs or heart theirs Um, because what happens is as you do that more people actually see this video so more people have an opportunity to bring these elements that can make a huge impact into their lives as well okay number four 
practice compassion. This one piggybacks on the previous one a little bit. Compassion is the recognition of suffering with the inclination to want to support ourselves rather than criticize ourselves or blame other people or blame ourselves, which is probably the unhealthiest mind trap we can ever get caught in. So what we want to do here is a repeated practice of intentionally paying attention to difficult emotions with a sense of curiosity and the inclination to care about ourselves sends the message to our brain that we're worth paying attention to. And we, as we start paying attention to difficult emotions in this way, we become less reactive and less afraid of them. And that's huge. Just imagine that. Imagine a difficult emotion surging up in your body and you just are not as reactive to it. Instead, you're more aware of what you're needing and you're inclining to give yourself that. Or even someone in your life that's that's triggering to you in some way, and you see it could be your kids, it could be a parent, it could be a coworker, and you see them have this difficult emotion, and instead of you reacting to it by closing down or fighting with them, you react with this recognition that here's this person who's suffering, and you have this inclination to want to support yourself or them in that moment. Uh, you'll find yourself with a great deal of balance and a sense of assuredness and groundedness as well in that moment. So instead of difficult emotions becoming something that we're afraid of, they inevitably become something that are teachers for us or guides for us to get better and better at feeling more confident in life, more understanding of the needs of ourselves and the needs of others. And they ultimately become more of a healing agent. So as we learn to practice compassion with ourselves and others, we can uh, ultimately um, facilitate more connection, a greater sense of connection, which if you've heard me talk before, you've heard me say that's at the epicenter of well-being or the epicenter of happiness. So imagine what the days and weeks and months ahead could be like if there was more of that facilitation of connection, which is at the epicenter of well-being. Number five, make peace with imperfection. People who learn how to make peace with the imperfection or understanding that to be imperfect means to be human can be way more effective in focusing on what matters in their life and definitely enjoying life more. So imagine this, instead of the constant barrage in our mind of self-judgment that comes with our, <laughs> with our imperfection, we swap it with the ability to be present and be able to hold ourselves with a sense of caring and lightness um, because we understand that everyone is imperfect. And again, to be imperfect means to be human. So the imperfections that arise become less of a struggle and more of a source of recognizing the common humanity of all people. And when we feel a connection with the common humanity of all people, we feel more safe and secure and less judgmental by ourselves. And we tend to feel more caring and loving towards ourselves, which helps gives us the energy to, again, take risks and focus on what matters to us and just ultimately be happier. Uh, the Zen priest Dogen Zenji said, to be in harmony with the wholeness of things is not to have anxiety over our imperfections. This is easier said than done, but, uh, but, this, but we can begin to incline our minds in this direction. Number six, embrace vulnerability. Our brain's default is to guard against vulnerability, and that doesn't take a rocket scientist or some kind of genius to understand why. If we're physically vulnerable, if we don't have our shield and armor on, then we're more likely to be physically injured or hurt or killed from you know thousands of years ago. And so uh, we now we take that on an emotional level. And so we, we're, we're predisposed to shut down to vulnerability. So what that does though, is that makes us suppress emotions. And I have another video here on the real dangers of uh, suppressing emotions that you might want to check out. But when we do that, um, we, we're not clear on what we're, we'll never get clear on what we're needing in any particular moment. So we'll never have the wisdom to be able to say, ah, when difficult emotions arise um, or uh, I'm feeling vulnerable emotionally, I'll, I'll never know what I'm, I'm, I'm needing. So I'll never be able to really heal myself or feel whole. And I'm also sending myself the message that I'm not worth actually paying attention to. And in a relationship, when we don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable, then we tell the person, we send a, a little unconscious signal to them that I don't really trust you. And so then they don't really trust you. And then the, there's not a connection. We allow ourselves to be vulnerable. We create a connection of trust. And when we feel, when we feel a sense of trust, we feel safe and good. 
When we allow ourselves to put ourselves in, in, a, in a position of growth, take a risk, for example, when for me, it's like speaking in front of larger and larger, larger audiences, I always feel, you know, vulnerable because I, ne I you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, in the back of my mind, a sense of, oh, there'll be some criticism coming and I'll be in danger. But when I allow myself to take that risk, to write a book, to be here right now doing this with you, um, I just learn and grow and grow. And so we grow by being vulnerable. Vulnerability is where the gold is. And so as we begin to allow ourselves to do that more and more, we begin to trust ourselves and grow more confident. And that's how that can make a huge impact on our lives. One more thing about vulnerability. Of course, this doesn't mean that we're vulnerable everywhere and at all times. We still need to be discerning. But as we allow ourselves to do this in spaces where we feel safe enough, we begin to trust ourselves more and more, become more confident about living the life we want to live. Okay, number seven, understand that all things come and go. If there is anything that is an ultimate truth in life is that all things come and go, except for, of course, that law. <laughs> that one remains constant. So when we close our eyes, and listen to sounds, you hear, like my voice, sounds coming and going. And, uh, and that, that's just one example of that. When we open our eyes and we look around, we see that seasons, they also shift and change and come and go. Even in Los Angeles, there's seasons, <laughs> I've noticed. Food comes in our mouths and the taste is there and then it's gone. Uh, we're born on this earth and we grow up and we have all kinds of great experiences and adventures and difficulties that we're working with and eventually that begins to pass away and we understand how precious life really is. And we begin to put our phones down more often maybe. Or we uh, open our eyes more to the sacred moments that are really there in our everyday life. So as I continue to hear over and over again from any parent, it all goes by so fast. I'll never forget when my wife was pregnant for the first time and we'd walk by anybody from all walks of life, contexts, races, ethnicities, um, across socioeconomic stratas, everyone would say the same thing. Really, be present to it because it all goes by so fast. So as you're taking this seventh one in, settling in and taking this in maybe all learn to savor this preciousness of life this reminds me of the poem the summer day by mary oliver and so i'm just going to recite it to you right now and uh, if you've heard this a, a thousand times or a million times, or this is the first time, take a moment, soften your body, take a deep breath, release, and take this in. Allow this to be a moment in your life. And then just notice how you feel. Okay. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Okay, now, if you want to go deeper on these seven elements and more, then go ahead and click on the link below to the free training called the Uncover the Power Within Blueprint. In that training, I'm going to bring you through all the stages you need in order to really get unstuck, uh, regain a sense of personal control, be able to focus more on what matters to you, and ultimately enjoy life more. So again, that's in that, there's a link to that free training uh, in the description below, and go ahead and register for that now. Ultimately, like anything else, realizing the changes you want to make in your life for a better life can best be done with regular access to mentorship you trust, a sound teaching, and a community of people who are going to be there to inspire, motivate, and cheer you on along the way. 
If you wanna go deeper with this and work with me, then you can look at the link below to the Uncover the Power Within program and click on that link and in there you can also set up a call and we can explore whether it makes sense for us to work together. Finally, if this lesson was valuable for you, please like it and don't forget to subscribe for more. I'll leave a few suggested videos on the next screen that I think you're going to love.